For today's scripture, I have um, deviated from the lectionary, um, taken the liberty as a summer worship leader, and it is actually a, a scripture passage that you'll probably hear again around the end of November. But my guess, it, it, it went with what I felt like I wanted to say today. And I have a feeling that Reverend Nicholas and I will likely have a different take on, on it. So that's fine. And it's, you know, several months away. So hopefully that's okay. Um, for the scripture today, I've chosen the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 34 to 45. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they, will, then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Truly I tell you, just as you did it or did not do it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it or did not do it to me. In these few words, Jesus sums up a large part of his ministry. Not only that which he teaches, but also that which he embodies, love, compassion, service, and prayer. Jesus' ministry was embodied by his compassion for those in need and by his frequent time alone to connect with God. This scripture could be interpreted as referring to charity or humanitarianism, but let us look at it in an even deeper way. The love and compassion that Jesus embodies goes beyond those things. God created the world out of an abundance of love, pouring love generously over all people all the time. Because we are created in God's image, we are called to give as God gives, freely and repeatedly. We give of ourselves to those who need our help, whether or not we like what they stand for, whether or not we agree with them, whether or not they can pay us back. We give as has been given to us, without conditions. We're not trying to earn points from God or anyone else. We're not trying to secure a place in heaven after we die. Showing love and compassion here on earth is what we were created to do. Jesus did not pick and choose those he would help. If they asked for help, they received it. There's no judgment as to who is more deserving than another. Jesus is not telling us that we should take care of those we choose to, 
or those we feel are more deserving of care. There can be no speculation about what someone will do with any money we may give to them. We are simply called to look into the faces of other people and there see Jesus' face. And who are we called to love? Again, Jesus leads by example. We are called to love everyone, no matter what. Jesus could have carried out his ministry among the pretty people, the rich and famous, in the temples, but instead he took to the streets. He talked to the poor, the lonely, the marginalized. He chose as his disciples a group of fishermen who were considered among the lowest in society. He healed the ones who were untouchable, like lepers and bleeding women. He walked the dusty roads with nothing but the clothes on his back. He ate with tax collectors and healed the family members of Roman soldiers. I used to watch a television program called Touched by an Angel, where the angel would go around the world and help people who needed something in their lives. There was one particularly memorable two-part episode that focused on the student-led protests calling for political reform in China, leading to a massacre by the government in Tiananmen Square back in the 1980s. In the TV show, one of the students was in prison, suspected of acting against the government. The angel was assigned to protect the student, and when the student was brutally beaten, the angel, who never left her side, took the brunt of the blows. When the student was thrown down a set of stairs, the angel shielded her body from the worst of the trauma, which of course caused suffering for the angel. It gave me a vision of the way God stands with every person in their suffering, no matter the circumstances. God suffers with us with every other person and with every aspect of creation. According to Reverend John Buchanan, who is a Presbyterian pastor in Chicago, when Jesus says, what you do for the least of these you do for me, he was highlighting three statements that were radical for Jesus' time. First, Jesus was saying that God is here with us, among us, in the messiness and uncertainty of life, not somewhere removed. God is here, in the neighbor who needs us, in the weak, the vulnerable, the children. God is in the sick, the prisoners, the poor, the oppressed, the needy, the misguided. There is nowhere that God is not. Second, Jesus was making a comment on the practice of religion in the world. Consider the number of people, countries, organizations, and governments over the centuries that have committed terrible atrocities in the name of God. These groups and individuals condemn one another, spend money and energy to exclude one another, fight over who is right and who is wrong, what is true and what is false, all kinds of things that Jesus said nothing about. What he did say was, when you do it to one of the least of these, you do it to me. Nothing about theology, creeds, doctrines, only this. Did you see Jesus in the face of the other? And did you give yourself in love in Jesus' name? Third, God wants to save each one of us by touching our hearts with love and giving us the gift of a true, deep, authentic human life, which God has already given and does so continually. God wants to save us from obsessing about our own needs and persuade us to worry and care about others. God wants us to know that to love is to live. Shifting gears, where is Ebenezer United Church in all this? Part of our mission 
statement is to serve our community with compassion. And we have a number of ongoing projects that we support that we all know about. Blue Door, Good Food, Camp Scugog, Juliet's Place, the Crisis Pregnancy Centre, occasional support for some refugee families. And we contribute to m and through the United Church of Canada. And this is all good. But during the pandemic, we got out of the habit of gathering, meeting, working together. We did carry on worshiping together on Zoom, and the Blue Door Shelter still had use of our building. But the pandemic put many of us on edge. And with that, as well as other changes that have occurred, we need to relearn our work and our mission together. It's not a unique situation. I heard on the news this week that there is a severe shortage of foster care families for service animals. The dogs that are bred to be service animals are typically trained in foster homes. And there were lots of volunteer foster homes before the pandemic, but apparently not now. There are still pups and many people who need the service but without the foster families to give the initial training and socialization, the program will not work. Similarly, it feels to me like Ebenezer is kind of stuck with a great need for people to step up and accept roles within the church. What do we need? For one, we need a ministry plan to get us back on track with fulfilling our mission. And we need someone to take that on. It may be that we need Reverend Forrester to take that leadership, but he cannot do it alone. We are also not in a great place in terms of our finances, which the board has been hearing about for over a year. We need some kind of stewardship team and program to decide how this will be addressed. A question was asked at one of our stewardship coaching sessions. Would Ebenezer members respond more positively positively to a stewardship drive or a fundraising drive? It's an interesting question and one that needs to be looked into. There is support. The wheel has already been invented. We have resources and a coach, but what is needed is the people, the team. And of course, there's the tower. A letter has already gone out to all members asking that they prayerfully consider making a donation to the tower restoration. And some money has come in. Thank you very much for that. Clyde will secure a loan, but then the loan will have to be repaid. What do we need? We need people, energy, and money in order to carry on the work that Jesus calls us to do. We need people to serve in whatever capacity brings them joy and fulfillment. There is a place for each person to serve in his or her own way. And thank you very much to those who have continued to do the work of the church through all of the uncertainty and change of the past few years. In pondering all of this, I have been thinking lately about Joan Shaw. Many of you will remember her. Joan was not one to sit around. It would drive her crazy to sit at the board table and discuss seemingly endlessly how something would work or how we will manage to get something done. On more than one occasion, I heard Joan say, enough talk, let's just get going. Maybe it's time for some Joan Shaw energy. Truly I tell you, just as you did it, or did not do it, to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it, or did not do it, to me. When we share our gifts of time, talent, and treasure with the world, our spirits soar beyond the veil to touch the very face of God. When we work to serve others, we serve God. Let us remember the question, did you see the face of Jesus in the other? 
And did you give yourself in love in Jesus' name? Thanks be to God.